call today. This is a, a kickoff call for the Puerto Rico 5G zone. Um, the Puerto Rico 5G zone um, is uh, a state-of-the-art 5G laboratory that's uh, being set up by uh, collaboration between XQ, which is a data security company, Solaris Capital, uh, from which I work, this is Kurt Blumen, the Indiana 5G Advanced Innovation and Test Lab, also known as the Indiana 5G Zone. Uh, so, so we really see a, a very interesting opportunity here to put Puerto Rico in a leadership position for 5G and all of the all of the efficiencies that can it can bring to uh, the island in terms of. Uh, advanced manufacturing, resilient energy, and, and other verticals where 5G is an enabler. So the, the primary goal of the 5G zone is to enable uh, entities both in government, uh, industry, and academia to better understand those opportunities that, that are presented by 5G. And, and we see that, um, as I mentioned, that Puerto Rico now puts itself in a position uh, with this 5G lab to become a thought leader to create uh, some advanced innovation and intellectual property, which we also think will stimulate uh, new companies and new ideas that will be commercialized. So we think this is a great, a really great opportunity to uh, to help fortify uh, the future in Puerto Rico. The uh, the initial push, the initial push for uh, the five G zone is to um, have it located in Mayaguez, which is on the west coast of the island, which is where the University of Puerto Rico resides and, and the engineering uh, department there. So we think that there are a lot of uh, synergies that, that um, kind of could tie together this, this 5G lab um, and headquartering that in Mayaguez, along with all of the, um, all of the different efforts that are, are being done there on the engineering side. But uh, in addition to that, we envision uh, satellite lab locations where other other parts of the island uh, could have uh, small labs that would be able to remotely access the test bed that is uh, that could be made available in the 5G zone. And, and uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, Sean Hendricks and the Indiana 5G zone that have already kind of laid the groundwork in their efforts in Indiana for for this kind of setup. So that's that's um, that's been a very uh, a very helpful boost for for this effort that we're bringing to Puerto Rico. Um, Kurt, could I just interject a thought to put this into context from a Puerto Rico perspective? Um, in the location that we're talking about out in Mayaguez, we're working with. So Indiana has the the first. Um, 5G uh, cybersecurity uh, focused uh, center of excellence test beds in the U.S. Wisconsin has the first connected systems institute around IoT for manufacturing. Um, we're also working with them so that the two facilities would be co-located and we would be the first place in the country where both of those things would work together. Um, and I also want to put into context the individuals on the call, um, a Christian who's from Openware. Openware is a company that specializes in AI. And in fact, um, they're one of the fastest growing uh, tech companies in the country um, and have done a lot of really interesting AI um, technologies um, from a tracking perspective. So I I'm hoping that kind of puts the individuals on the call and some of the, the concepts that we're looking at into context as Puerto Rico being the first in the country and then that important alignment to the um, pharmaceutical, medical device, and logistics industry being served by that, that center. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Uh, and I think now it's an appropriate time to bring in Randy Clark, who's the, the vice chair at the National Spectrum Consortium, to, to give us a little bit of a, a background in, uh, on 5G and, and uh, where it resides here in uh, Puerto Rico. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Clark. Uh, I am the elected vice chair of the National Spectrum Consortium. Um, I am also uh, do business development work for the Department of Defense and National Security Agencies at Verizon Wireless. Um, I've spent my career um, in technology, uh, starting uh, as a Marine Corps communicator uh, many years ago uh, in the first Gulf War. Um, the National Spectrum Consortium is an other transactional authority, so it's an OTA. And OTAs are uh, 
you know, uh, are responsible for the rapid acquisition uh, process to speed prototyping to production efforts for the Under Secretary of Defense and Research and Engineering. Uh, our chairman, Shao Dietrich, um, is quoted a very good quote of saying prototyping makes good policy. And uh, of course, this certainly is true. Uh, we also uh, reap other benefits from prototyping, and that's shortening the time to market for many new technology innovations. Uh, on the verge of uh, the capabilities that 5G um, are going to bring to bear. Um, our consortium uh, is chartered to collaborate with the Department of Defense and other federal agents and uh, the U.S. industrial base, uh, academia, uh, non-traditional small businesses uh, to help the acceleration of leap ahead technologies in 5G. You know, our primary focus is around spectrum agility, so how you operate through contested and congested spectral environments. Uh, this is a, 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 a leading technology for the U.S. globally. Uh, also, zero trust cybersecurity architectures and dual use architectures and technologies like learning and edge compute, AR, VR, and IoT as examples. Um, I'll just note that I, I am a native of Wisconsin and went to the University of Wisconsin, so please hear that comment earlier. <laughs> Uh, you know, the underpinning well, wireless platform that is going to usher in the digital modernization and accelerate this nation's economic development, uh, at the same time increasing the operational efficiency of our government. The National Spectrum Consortium is focused on high-performance, high-security 5G network architectures uh, that will meet the needs of the smart factory and the smart flight line by focusing on power resiliency telecommunications isolation, and zero trust. These three, what I refer to as blackout manufacturing uh, requirements are fundamental uh, to any smart instance of the future. Uh, so I'll explain each one uh, briefly. Uh, of course, you can do a presentation on each one independently. However, power resiliency is required to ensure that we drive, uh, you know, the critical operations and information technologies that run the smart factories and the smart uh, cities, right? Uh, this on-site, you know, renewable energy and storage is a sustainable way to achieve this goal. Uh, telecommunications isolation, you know, enables uh, is enabled by the installation of a localized uh, soft switch core uh, that allows us to locally switch and provision our uh, our smart assets. Uh, without connectivity to the cloud or remote core. Um, this is important when we lose T1 connectivity. Uh, you know, we still have achieved independent site operations that will allow us to, to continue our mission. You know, very similar to power, where when we lose power from the grid, uh, if we are sustaining our IT operations with sustainable renewable energy and storage, uh, we don't need the grid. So these are important elements to any smart instance uh, because it allows you to quote unquote, do that blackout manufacturing, right? In blackout environments, I can continue to manufacture. In the DOD perspective, uh, you know, uh, with remote, I, I can continue to be efficient uh, because I've been self-sustaining through resilient design. The last of that is software-based zero trust, you know, which enables us to protect data in transit over untrusted hardware over any IT modality uh, globally. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about zero trust later on. Um, of course, all of these good technologies need a solid business case to scale. And in the case of smart cities and smart bases, uh, we have a real opportunity to leverage P4s, public-public-private partnerships to engage uh, in the funding uh, of the infrastructure deployments uh, and use the sale of the renewable energy sources to pay back the original investment and support the maintenance deals of, of these new networks. Uh, these concepts hold true uh, in our dual-use methodology, and we can start uh, this by uh, closer collaboration between federal and state 5G research labs and those within academia. Uh, the National Spectrum Consortium and our members play a key role in this conversation to ensure our continued in arguably a trillion-dollar 5G ecosystem. So, you know, with those thoughts, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rear Admiral Peter J. Brown, uh, U.S. Coast Guard uh, 
Admiral Brown currently serves as the President Trump's special representative for uh, Puerto Rico disaster recovery efforts. Uh, Admiral Brown, sir, uh, the mic is yours. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all for putting together this call. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about um, the electrical grid for Puerto Rico and how its uh, lack of reliability has resulted in a lot of companies uh, becoming uh, under duress at the same time, pharmaceutical or aerospace or electronic companies and uh, power companies uh, generating their own power um, to produce uh, resiliency for operations uh, when uh, the system has failed them. Um, a related story uh, that I've heard multiple times in Puerto Rico is that um, the lack of uh, consistent and reliable communications associated with power failures has also hampered business. So, for example, an electronics manufacturer or a test facility that relies on communication back with the mainland, although they may have an island of electricity uh, where the communications infrastructure existing in Puerto Rico had failed them, uh, they were unable to uh, continue business uh, as normal um, in, a, in a time of duress. And so many of these companies have now also become uh, alternatively communication companies, um, investing in facilities and capabilities of their own, many of them satellite-based, and uh, they could certainly benefit uh, from the enhanced uh, capability, reliability, and resiliency of the next generation 5G network uh, in Puerto Rico, and that would uh, um, reduce the barriers to entry uh, for new businesses uh, in Puerto Rico, as well as uh, make more competitive those companies that are currently doing business in Puerto Rico that may have the opportunity to expand. Again, whether that's in pharmaceuticals and our national medical supply chain, whether it's in uh, entertainment, information management, uh, the creative arts, uh, whatever field of endeavor, obviously <clears throat> rapid and reliable communication at high data rates is, uh, is important to the world that we're living in, we'll live in in the future. So any project that can enhance capability, uh, reliability, and resilience across the communications infrastructure is something that will be very appealing uh, both to government and non-governmental functions in Puerto Rico. Last two things I'll say relate less directly uh, to business customers, but more to the people of Puerto Rico. So two areas of endeavor where uh, the people of Puerto Rico are underserved uh, relative to their mainland counterparts, absolutely vital uh, to quality of life, are education and telehealth. And, uh, and in both cases, a uh, lack of uh, reliable and uh, high-speed internet access has hampered the ability of the government of Puerto Rico to deliver services to the people and, you know, flip the script around. Uh, it's hampered the ability of the most vulnerable and uh, needy populations uh, to get to the services that they most need, very specifically education and health care. And so uh, there's great interest in uh, building a new uh, telecommunications infrastructure and uh, ecosystem uh, term that was used a couple minutes ago uh, to uh, better service the people of Puerto Rico, both in their business endeavors and in their quality of life. Thank you, Admiral Brown. Those are, those are um, excellent points, and, and it just shows the breadth of the importance of this um, uh, particular project. Um, so, so I think, you know, that, that was, there, there were two um, hopes and, and um, objectives in this phone call. And number one is the idea of just uh, making you aware and, and uh, making the White House um, Science and Te Technology Office aware of this um, important opportunity, but also um, there, there is, this, this project is moving forward and there's support from a, a public-private perspective. Um, but there is additional funding that would help to scale it up, and so we were hoping to, um, with this team, kind of brainstorm where there might be some opportunities um, to enhance that, that um, you know, the footprint of what this could mean for the island. Yeah, so thank you, Gail. And I am not aware of specific federal funding associated with this, at least not in the disaster recovery lane. Uh, but the governor of Puerto Rico has set aside, with uh, FOMB approval, 
a, uh, a quantity of money. Uh, I believe the number that I most recently heard a couple months ago was $400 million uh, to improve uh, internet access and telecommunications overall uh, for the island. Um, I would have to find out, I don't know if uh, Invest or DDAC or uh, another part of the government of Puerto Rico would have more details available on, you know, how the money is uh, is being metered out and uh, what the criteria for accessing and using that money might be. That's fantastic. I, um, I will, I'll certainly explore that from an Invest Puerto Rico perspective. Sean Hendricks, director of the Indiana 5G zone. Sean? Yeah, thanks, Kern, and thanks, everyone, uh, for the opportunity to talk today. I guess I just want to say, number one, I'm very excited. Um, it was just a few short weeks ago that uh, uh, me and my team had the opportunity to engage with the Puerto Rico team and explore what I'm finding to be a very um, productive and meaningful partnership. And uh, it, it kind of, you know, here in Indiana, we started an initiative just over a year ago uh, with the goal to help government, industry, and academia um, collaborate and better understand the opportunities that are presented by 5G. Uh, some of the previous speakers have talked about how 5G is evolving, but I'd also like to mention that there's still a lot of unknowns and there's still a lot of work to be done. And so being able to bring together entities in a collaborative way uh, so that we can enhance our thought leadership, drive the requirements, help understand the solutions related to 5G in a practical way um, is, a, is a useful form of collaboration. Uh, and it, uh, we, we took kind of a, uh, I'll say a state-centric uh, view initially in that when we looked at 5G, it was it's a very large uh, space. And so we tried to pick areas that we were traditionally good at and um, use this technology or focus on the digital transformation of these physical industries, uh, specifically the areas of agriculture, uh, manufacturing, uh, smart cities, and national security and public safety. These are areas that Indiana already plays in and has an industrial base established, but as we all understand, 5G is really uh, rapidly transforming this from industries into digital industries. Um, to give some kind of uh, some color behind that, um, we also try to focus on the dual use nature of the technology. I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, national security and public safety. And you know, one may initially look at this and say, what's that have to do with manufacturing, agriculture, uh, cities, and maybe even mobility? And while these applications are very different, um, the national security application and say the city's ap city application, really the underlying fundamental technologies though are very similar. So the ability to connect um, high bandwidth, low latency devices in a massive IoT environment, the ability then to do uh, information processing at the edge, and then um, share that information in a network fashion between other edges and the cloud. Um, these, these techniques, technologies, uh, methods, and strategies apply in all of the various use cases. So in the Indiana 5G zone, we, we began to recognize that really building a test bed that allows um, our partners to work in an end to end fashion, so from device to the edge to the cloud, and really. Um, applications uh, was kind of the, the way we wanted to go to get towards our kind of, uh, goal of practical 5G. As we're starting to stand up the, the, the Indiana 5G zone, we, we went operational just a couple weeks ago, yet we still continue to expand the test environment and refine our configurations, tools, and methods. As we've done this, we've been pulling in and, and working with a number of industry partners, academic partners, and now a uh, larger, larger uh, group of uh, of public uh, and other public sector partners. And what's interesting is our charter comes from the uh, from the Indian Economic Development Corporation. So from one point of view, we're really an economic development entity, but not in the traditional sense of you know tax incentives and things like that. Our 
this is that economic development and economic opportunity will come as a result of innovation. And innovation only comes as a result of collaborating with others um, in, your, in your neighborhood, so to speak. And so, again, the opportunity to reach out and uh, collaborate with Puerto Rico to share our lessons learned about our test bed. Um, but frankly, it's also been an opportunity to see the 5G applications from a different perspective. So we talked earlier in the call about uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing, electronics, et cetera. India has some of these businesses, some of these manufacturing uh, industries as well. So there's similarities, but there's also a number of differences in how we deal with the unique environments that we're working in. Uh, Randy mentioned earlier um, about the, uh, the concept of resilient power. So how we manage these assets and, and applications. So at the end of the day, um, these uh, you know it's necessary to uh, to partner because we can't do it all by ourselves. The five G pie is is very large, and it takes this network of collaboration to um, to help uh, build a network, a system of test beds that's really greater than the sum of the parts. I think what's what's very interesting going forward is that. And in uh, a few months from now, when the Puerto Rico test bed is active, we're not just going to have a Puerto Rico test bed and an Indiana test bed. We're actually going to have two test beds that will be able to interact, uh, talk, communicate, and run prototypes and experimentation with one another. So we'll essentially have built a larger macro test bed consisting of the two parts. But I think that's a, that goes to really a... Uh, um, how we see a lot of the benefits of, uh, of fostering and participating in these collaborations. And uh, I just really want to say in conclusion, uh, thanks to Kurt and the Puerto Rico team for inviting us in and uh, giving us an opportunity to share our experience, but also being a great partner and uh, helping, uh, helping grow our understanding of 5G by the work that's happening in Puerto Rico. Thank you so much, John. Um, is anyone from the um, from uh, OSPP on the call? Yeah, you got Eric Berger here. Wonderful. I, I would appreciate so much your thoughts or, or um, you know any insights. Yeah, well, definitely this is a model that that we you know really prefer. We talked about like from the National Spectrum Consortium and. and uh, Wisconsin and Illinois, you know, actually building stuff and, and, and you know, seeing what works, you know, creates, yeah, you know, I mean, creates companies because you, you find, you know, you think you can do this with a technology, it doesn't quite work, but you actually discover something much better. Uh, we also like it because of the uh, private nature, namely, it's not just the government handing out money and hoping something sticks. We're, you know, the NSF does that, and they do it very well, but at this, you know, stage in the development of the technology to, to share, you know, a little bit of the risks and uh, to encourage private industry to invest uh, generally comes out with much better, better results. Um, something to think about as, and for one thing, I know you asked, you know, what about money? I, you know, the uh, in why the NSC is on here, you know, DOD, RDT, and E does have some budget. So if you can think of projects or uh, things that again have that uh, dual use nature, uh, you know, there may be some funding there uh, that's not like disaster related or or uh, you know regular, I guess, development related. Um, something that would help. Really, with the, you know the, the, the global uh, you know view is you know what's special about uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and, and not so much necessarily because actually Puerto Rico does have some things that are, are geographically unique. For example, in the mid band, water uh, presents quite a challenge depending on the weather, uh, and so you know projects around that, and that would be definitely a uh, a good DOD partnership to look at because it's the uh, uh, you know Navy radars that, that you know have problems in the mid band where uh, how can you say you know Puerto Rico is a more 
contested environment. Uh, so that's something that can be brought there. Certainly, there's a lot of work on you know repairing and revitalizing the manufacturing base uh, in, in Puerto Rico. So you know the and then what I thought I heard was you know one of the focuses of, of this partnership would be possibly you know also manufacturing. So so that you know is sensible. But you know things like that 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 can tie in. Uh, how should say makes it a better sale uh, you know, throughout throughout the federal enterprise. Um, other than that, I, I, I think I'm hearing good things. Over. Great, thank you. And, and, and um, to your point about the, the manufacturing side of the equation, um, it was very purposeful that um, actually, um, I will actively say I'm, I'm kind of the data person of this call and um, Wisconsin and Indiana always kind of trade back and forth on a yearly basis who has the highest concentration of manufacturing um, uh, in the in the U.S. Um, I, it kind of switched shifts back and forth between Wisconsin and Indiana. And so it was very purposeful that those were two best case um, and best practice examples that Puerto Rico looked at um, in putting together this this um, center of excellence moving forward, and, and manufacturing would be a big focus area. Um, but I really appreciate your comments on, um, you know, the the, the radar and the the, um, kind of the military uh, perspective in terms of the significance. So that's something I think for the team to really think through. It's not necessarily a be all end all, but you know, think of things. You know, I just you know, not looking at it closely. Maybe there's something. Around coexistence with our Cebu, uh, or you know, backhaul, or something like that. You know, things that leverage the, the uniqueness of uh, of the island. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's that's great input. In, in talking about five G, obviously, um, without a secure five G um, platform, um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's problematic. So. Uh, one of the companies that we have here today on the call uh, is a Silicon Valley based <laughs> company that developed a very unique platform for securing uh, not only 5G but other other platforms. And so today we have uh, Brian Wayne, the CEO of XQ, on the phone with us. And uh, thank you everyone for having us today. Um, I'm Brian Wayne, CEO of, of XQ. Uh, so to put it simply, XQ enables the encryption and tracking of data as it moves across platforms. API-based data protection platform that provides quantum safe packet encryption and tracking, or more simply, uh, encryption as a service. It's special that we conceived of this new security architecture where the data and the encryption 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 move separately. We're never together and we never have the data. So it makes it incredibly difficult to target it's very scalable and very secure. This allows us allows all types of systems to talk together safely across existing infrastructure that couldn't do so before. So uh, right now, I, 5G IoT data is wide open. Uh, we're here to protect it easily and cost effectively across systems. For example, like data moving from a sensor to a cloud in a 5G network, or email moving from one account to another. So say you have a network of IoT devices. With XQ on each device, the data is encrypted, and can then travel across any open network to any other edge device or server application and be decrypted. And the two endpoints never have to know about each other other than an address. That's super powerful. So we can track a Gmail message across the internet or even as it moves to Outlook. When that message is decrypted or uh, even if it's decrypted by, say, a hacker in like Russia or China. So the benefit is to protect America and Port or American and Puerto Rican jobs and IP. Resilient power grids and, and blackout manufacturing. The 5G zone will help encrypt, track, and manage 5G IoT data, as well as providing a base layer of communication uh, protection in apps like Gmail, Outlook, and Text. Um, so we will give to companies a safe space to innovate and we will help them bring those new products out into the world safely as they're commercialized. Um, obviously, in partnership with uh, everyone on this call and, and, and everyone that ends up joining the uh, Puerto Rico 5G, 5G zone. Um, to give you an example of some of the um, customer integration projects that we're already working on with Indiana, um, there's a smart manufacturing lab that Sean is putting together. The inaugural tenant is GE. Uh, excited about that. We'll be part of the backbone there. There are uh, several smart energy uh, projects, microgrid for power resiliency, everything from you know a mobile uh, generator that's 5G in, 
condenser enabled to uh, you know a, a lamp post with a battery and a 5G antenna on it. Um, smart resources extraction, so an oil well with um, 5G and sensors. Um, smart logistics, so say that you're the DoD or Amazon, um, where are you, is your inventory right now? Um, for, with trust, the trusted electronics lab, we're helping them protect their um, their IP. But everything from uh, like secure tra- uh, contract transmission for like mortgage companies or trusted um, personal information intake for um, like healthcare companies. These are the sort of things that we're helping with. Um, and all this data needs to be kept safety of the public. So, um, in closing, we're, we're super excited to have been selected for this opportunity, and we look forward to working together with the Puerto Rico 5G zone to increase what's possible there. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Um, our last speaker is, uh, is actually uh, from a Puerto Rican company that is a subcontractor to the DOD. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Carlos Melendez, the COO of Wovenware. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, Wovenware is, is a, a local Puerto Rican based uh, uh, technology company. We got founded in 2003, actually by Christian Gonzalez and, and myself. And we are an AI consultancy and software development company. Although we are based in Puerto Rico, the majority of our customers are actually in the mainland US. We have customers in Virginia, California, Oregon, Massachusetts, Nevada. And, and a couple more uh, states. Uh, currently, we have more than 140 employees, uh, all based uh, in San Turso, where, where our office is. And we provide a platform that facilitates uh, the complete AI uh, development life cycle, the artificial intelligence uh, development life cycle, which includes labeling data, uh, creating custom model training and predictive analytics, integrating those models into production systems and retraining them and making sure that they keep uh, learning and performing to, to the spec. We have a APS, a CI facility clearance, uh, as well as being an 8A company and a Hobson certified company. And we work on computer visions as a subcontractor uh, for a couple of, of agencies, uh, including the NDA, NRO and and DOD. Some of the work that we have done has actually become uh, either public data sets or or have have been very important to to certain uh, DOD projects. And uh, Christian Gonzalez here, uh, and and I think I wanted to add a little bit uh, related to the 5G zone, we've been doing a lot of work pushing uh, AI computing to the edge. Specifically, since we're working a lot with satellite imagery and computer vision problems, that requires a lot of uh, processing power, even to do inferences with with artificial intelligence models. So we're working on uh, technology to move uh, the inferencing to the edge uh, and uh, uh, enabling technologies like 5G are going to help this uh, in, in this endeavor, a lot, special, especially for, for the warfighter that's uh, somewhere out there trying to get some some geo intelligence, uh, which are most of the projects that we're working on with the NGA and the NRO. So, uh, just wanted to uh, put that in there. Great, thank you, Christian. So that I think that that. Um, wraps up where we are in, in, in terms of uh, hearing what the, the vision here for the 5G zone. And, and obviously we have, uh, you know, our next steps are securing funding and we appreciate the feedback and, and suggestions there that, that may be useful. Um, and additionally, we'll be uh, appointing a, a 5G, a PR 5G zone director and then uh, securing the, the site location in my list. But um, all of this is uh, very exciting. We have, uh, I think, as you've heard today on, on the call, we have a, a, the A team of, uh, of folks surrounding this project, uh, which I think will will only add to the the success of, of this uh, Puerto Rico 5G zone. And, and I think we're uh, we're very fortunate to have all the individuals and and groups uh, that have per- chosen to participate and support this effort in Puerto Rico. And, and we appreciate uh, Admiral Brown and. 
and uh, Eric Berger, we appreciate your uh, participation on the call today. And along with Gail, Gail, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you. And as always, Admiral Brown, thank you so much for your support of Puerto Rico. And um, Juan, thank you so much for uh, helping facilitate the call. And, and thank you, everyone, for a, a, a great conversation. It's exciting for Puerto Rico. Thank you, Gail. Take care, everyone. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.